when I give, when I gave all diligence to write unto you that the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So he says in the beginning of verse 3 that his intention was to keep talking about what he was talking about in verses 1 and 2. He started out this epistle talking about being saved, sanctified, preserved, and called, and we have mercy and peace and love. And he says, and beloved, <laughs> that's what I planned on talking about. <laughs> that's what this letter was going to be about. But the, <laughs> the Holy Spirit had other ideas. You see, that's why we know this isn't automatic writing. In the occult, they have this thing where people are possessed and they go into a trance and they write. And that's not what happened here. The Holy Spirit doesn't take you and commandeer your body like a devil does. The Holy Spirit fills you and moves you. And in the, in the writing of the Scripture, He moved these men and guided their writing, but it wasn't an automatic writing. He allowed them to express themselves. You see, their personality. And here Jude even says, I had the intention of writing my salvation. But it was needful. And that's important because, you know, it might be more fun for us to play Bible Bingo, for example. You ever play Bible Bingo? No. There's Bible Scrabble, Bible Monopoly. Pretty much any game out there, they've tried to commandeer it into the Christian, you know, and, and make it Bible Uno. <laughs> Bibleopoly is what it's called. Bibleopoly. And that might be a little more fun, but it's needful that we study the Word. It's needful that we just open the book, read it, and study it. And that's what Jude is saying. Is I had the intention of writing about our common salvation, but it was needful that He changed the tone, changed the direction, and exhort us to earnestly contend. When I think of a contender, I think of a boxer. You know, the contender. Well, that's a... That's a that's you know sometimes sports just is the best you know yeah perfect example <laughs> because that's what he's talking about here he's talking about fighting he's saying put up a fight for the faith he's saying take it seriously learn the word and be willing to put up your dukes <laughs> and fight for the faith look over at a passage you've probably heard but think of it in terms we're talking about second timothy 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. And uh, starts out in chapter 4 with some great words. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead that is appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. But now look at what Paul says about his own ministry in verse 6. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. You know, Paul is consumed constantly with the theme of the return of Jesus Christ. I think if you're going to be a useful, Spirit-filled vessel of God to be used to Him, you should be constantly thinking about His return. That should be on your mind all the time. You ought to talk about it a lot. Think about it. In your prayers, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And that's the kind of guy Paul was. And he said he had fought a good fight. You know, a lot of people take this out of this context, and when they talk about fighting a good fight, they, they're talking about um, finances. and Which is, I'm not saying these things aren't a part of your Christian walk. You have to deal with finances. You have to deal with these things. But... Very few people think of this in the context of preaching the gospel and contending for the faith. But that's what these scriptures are about. They're about contending, defending the truth, exposing the lie. 
standing for what's right. You hear it more often for some earthly cause. You know, yeah. You know, save the whale. Yeah, I fu yeah, and you'll, you'll hear this. That, that's quoted. You know, some guy who spent his whole life fighting, um, you know, illiteracy or something. Mm -hmm. Well, Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what the that's not what this text is talking about. about. And you hear it applied that way. And he says what? Faith. The faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Word of God. He's talking about the Scriptures. Any religion, any denomination that takes and adds to this book, that's not a part of the faith. The faith has been delivered. It's done. It's the Scripture. And if you go in and you have the teachings of the church fathers, you have the teachings of the popes, you have the teachings of the creeds, you have the teachings of the councils, you have the Book of Mormon, you have the uh, writings of Mary Baker Eddy, or Ellen G. White, or whoever your cult leader is, that's not a part of the faith. The faith is what's before you right now. And we should learn it, and we should be ready to defend it. Why? Verse 4, Mike. He explains exactly why. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God to lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice a few things. These men that he's warning us about aren't from the outside looking in. They're not outside of churches preaching at the churches. They have crept in. They are in the churches. They are in the pulpits. And it says that they were before of old ordained to this condemnation. They are ungodly men. And look what they do. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, number one. So we have, number one, they are turning God's grace into a license to live in sin. So if you take any of these preachers who are preaching the grace of God in such a way that it gives you a license to sin, that's called antinomianism. Ever heard of that word? Yeah. Antinomianism. And you'll hear that, and if you read any kind of theological books or anything, you'll see they'll talk about antinomianism. And that is that there's no law there's no moral law, no moral code. And they, these men say that what you believe and what you do doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. They turn God's grace into lasciviousness. And in so doing, they are denying the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And you, I, I just don't think that very many Christians have taken this warning seriously. Right. And that explains why so many Christians have fallen. It's because they haven't taken this seriously. They don't really think, oh, it'll never happen to me. Mm -hmm. Or my church, it'll never happen to my church. But I can take you to people and I can take you to churches who have totally been destroyed because they just never took this warning, this, this commandment to contend for the faith seriously. And then preachers have come in and they've changed the doctrine, they've changed the Bibles, they've changed the, the message that's being preached and destroyed the church as far as God's concerned. There may still be a building there. They may still meet for Bible studies or where well, they wouldn't meet for Bible studies, but they'd meet for services. But what's inside that church is a false church. It's not even the real thing. How did it happen? Christians didn't take this seriously. And they let their guard down. I think this is what's happened to the United States of America. We had a constitution and people just didn't vigilantly stand for the principles that our founders laid out. And one thing after another has happened until we really don't have a constitutional republic in this country. Mm -hmm. Same thing in churches. In the seminaries, they started destroying the Bible, teaching false doctrines and heresies and apostasy set in, it creeped into the churches <coughs> through the preachers who crept in unawares. People were caught off guard. People thought, well, they came from the right school. They must be a good preacher. Mm -hmm. And then people trusted them because they came from the right school. 
And it, it, it comes down to an understanding of what the Gospel really is. Right. That Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross, He died for sin. When He was on the cross, He was there not as a martyr, which is what these liberals like to refer to Him as, but He died for sin. And when you look at Christ through the Scripture on the cross, you recognize He's there because of your sin, and there's repentance. A lot of people say you have to preach repentance. Well, I preach repentance, but no one told me I had to repent. I read the Word of God, read the Gospel, heard the Gospel, and when I believed, I was repentant. That's right. No one was looking at me saying, you need to repent. It's when you believe and you really understand what Christ has done for you, and you believe the Gospel, there's a work that takes place in you and you repent. And really, the Christian life itself is a life of repentance. It's a life of constantly saying, I know I'm unworthy. I know I shouldn't even be saved. And I know I should do better. Dear Lord, help me do, to do better. It's that kind of an attitude, a humility, a, a life of repentance. And uh, when it says they're denying the Lord, it, com it combines the meaning of reject or to contradict or disown. And of course, we don't want to be guilty of that, but we don't want to support people or teachers or preachers or denominations or books or whatever the case may be that reject, contradict, or disown the Lord Jesus. We want to be faithful. I think that's the, basically the call of the Christian life. When you stand before God in the end, the Bible says you either are not getting in, or He says, enter in, thou good and faithful servant. Faithful. And that's really our calling as, as far as all Christians across the board. All Christians. We're called to be faithful. Nothing special. God's not looking for a superhero. We're not going to rip our shirt off and have a big G. You know, the G-man. He's not expecting you, Serenity, to actually conquer the world. I mean, we've talked about her doing that, but you know, he's not actually looking for her to do that. He just wants you to be faithful. Some of the, I think, greatest rewards be dished out to people who are janitorial servants in churches. Women who cooked and cleaned, and then they find out someone shut in and they would take them a meal. Someone had surgery and they take them some food. Someone who couldn't cut the grass anymore. That's a servant's heart. I think there's going to be great reward for those people. Be sure to visit our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com where you can find the latest video messages posted on the front page and links to free downloads of our messages in MP3 format. That's kjvbiblebelievers.com This program is brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship. Thank you for listening.